to the fountain All who have sailed On the river of heartache I come to the sea Come on, be set free If you leave me, Lord, I will follow Where you leave me, Lord, I will go Come and hear me, Lord, I will follow Where you leave me, Lord, I will go I will go Welcome to this time and place for worship. It's our privilege to be an assembly of followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. The important thing is that God is here. And he has a word of greeting for us as we begin. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll rise and bow your spirit as we sing to the Lord.
that we're focusing on in these weeks it says that if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us when we gather to worship we not gather as perfect people and we feel the spirit convict us of our wrongs those that maybe we have ignored those that we have convinced ourselves out of and we feel that conviction and yet we admit that we come as sinners before a perfect God so like the psalmist let us say these words from Psalm 33. We acknowledge our sins to you, and we do not cover our sins. We confess our transgressions, and you forgive the offense of our sin. And our words of assurance come from the next verse that we're memorizing, 1 John 1, 9, which says this, and let's read this together as well. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Give us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our forgiveness has been promised by the Father and secured by the Son. God does not waver and He always keeps His word. And so we find our complete assurance in God's never ending commitment to us. He must and will forgive us, not because of our words, not because of our deeds, but because of His own word and because of His own works. And nothing is more assuring than that. So let's sing these words um, as we continue to sing that all we have is Christ. Our entire hope, our entire assurance comes because of his work on the cross and into his resurrection. was lost in darkest night, but thought I knew the way to sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own forever to your will, and if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I read my help on grace, indifferent to the cross, you looked upon my help to stay and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me, now all I know is great. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is So all might see the strength to follow your commands will never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only boast.
the children can continue in their worship in the children's church and at this point let's also greet one another uh, greeting each other with the love of Christ Father and you alone 
pray together? Lord, most of us have already had a lot of information this morning that we've received and have probably already forgotten most of it. Reading the Bible can be the same kind of thing. But that's not what we want. We ask that as the Bible is now read, that we might be able to recognize it as different, as words that you have given directly to us that we might be able to receive those words and retain them, that they might make a difference in our lives today. Hear us in Jesus. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. So hear God's word to us this morning. John 14. Verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that we may also, that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and he will do even greater things than these. Because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. I was here at the end of July, I was all excited because I was getting ready to perform a wedding for my granddaughter, Chelsea Barba. Okay, I'm on the other side of that. It was wonderful. They're old married people now for, let's see, this is the eighth. Tomorrow will be a month. Okay, that's way behind. Ten days ago, Janet and I celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary. Okay, that's way behind. <laughs> Last night, Janet and I took our daughter out to celebrate her 57th birthday. That's way behind. Meanwhile, those are all unusual things, right? Meanwhile, here are the things I usually do. I conduct funerals. Two weeks ago, I had one in a park. This coming Saturday, I'll have one in a restaurant. Yesterday, I had a graveside service at Chapel Hill. You'll notice all three of those, not a one, in a funeral parlor or a church. Cha times have changed. So. Yesterday morning, I stood beside a casket there at Chapel Hill West. I offered my words of comfort from the scripture to the two mourners who were there with 
me. And when it was over, because I knew that I was in Victory Garden section of Chapel Hill, I decided I would walk around and look at stones. When I was all finished, I went home, and from memory, I wrote down 40 names that I had recognized in that section. Some of them were people I knew. Some were children of people I knew. Some were grandchildren of people I knew. Uh, the three that got my attention are my current friends who are still alive, and their names were on the stones in anticipation. I uh, stood for a while in front of the stones of Peter and Celia Bardoff, my friends from this congregation. And then I stood for a moment in front of an open area where I expect that my body will be placed in a few years. Happy yet? <laughs> Made you joyful in this congregation? By the time I was finished with all of that, I went back to where the grave had been. The casket was long gone. They were just finishing heaping up the dirt on the grave. Well, guess what? That's how I prepared for this sermon. I'm ready now to hear from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, which is read almost every time I lead a funeral. Do you hear the words that were said? And do you remember when this happened? It was that Thursday night when Jesus was arrested, taken and tried, and that led to his execution the following afternoon. And in this passage, Jesus is saying things to his immediate followers that must have been very troubling. It's no wonder he started out by saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. I want to reflect on these 14 verses with you. It's really prompted, the passage is prompted by Jesus saying that he's going to leave these men. Something they don't want to hear, something they don't understand. And they really, I think, became quite fearful. Where are you going, Jesus? Why can't we go? And what do you mean by the things you're saying here tonight? And my sense is that they were afraid of being left behind. Maybe you've had that kind of fear at some point that you're going to get left behind left out, that the ones you cared about are going somewhere and you're not going to go, and they're not taking you with them, and I don't know, have you ever felt like you've been left behind by Jesus, that he might forget about you? Well, work with me. Let's see if we can enter into those feelings that the disciples were experiencing that night. And I think what's going on is that Jesus is addressing those feelings and he's trying to renew their peace, their, their sense that it's okay in the midst of what was really a very traumatic time. I suggest three main things that show up here. Jesus says that we can be at peace because we're going to follow him. In verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I don't remember feeling a lot of anxiety yesterday morning when I was walking around Chapel Hill. I think I was pretty much at peace. I wasn't consciously absorbing this passage, but I think that was happening. Jesus says, we're going to follow him. 
Now, Jewish people who had been watching him for three years, they didn't get it. The disciples who had been up close to him, they didn't get it. Where are you going, Jesus? It was, it was such an incredible idea that he was going to leave them that their minds pushed the reject button. Every time that he mentioned that he was leaving. And if he, is, he must be going to some other earthly location. Is that what you're talking about, Jesus? Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If, if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That's the phrase I want you to hear. I will come back and take you to be with me. Jesus is saying when, it, when it's our natural reaction to be scared about something, we can still be at peace that he's offering some help for heart trouble here. That help is faith and trust in him. He's saying these words to them to encourage them and strengthen them. And he's saying to them, you don't have to feel like you're in some kind of a blending machine, that, that you're all stirred up. You can go on believing in God and believing in Jesus. And you don't have to worry if you're thinking about what's beyond the grave. There are a lot of dwelling places. There are enough places for every follower of Jesus. I want to say to us this morning, to me and to you, that Jesus wouldn't talk like this that he's getting things ready for us if there was a chance that we're going to be left out, that we're going to be left behind. It's not going to happen. The real comfort is here in verse 3 that Jesus will come back for us. Now, Jesus comes back. It's probably not wise to try to push that into one particular answer as to what that means. Uh, he did come back, what, three days later, right? When he walked out of the grave, he came back to them. And repeatedly over the next 40 days, he appeared and he came back to them. So he came back quite soon for those disciples. But he also said a little in this chapter 14 that he was leaving and he was sending the Holy Spirit in his place. And the Holy Spirit comes to them and to us and he comes back by his Holy Spirit. Jesus comes back when an individual dies, doesn't he? He comes back and gets that person. And finally, Jesus someday soon is going to come back visibly in the clouds where everyone will see him. When he says, don't worry, I'm coming, you can be sure he is indeed coming. There will be peace. Okay, there's a second answer that should lead us to peace in this passage. And that shows up in verse 6. And that answer is, he is the way to God. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is the connecting. That should give us peace. You know verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <laughs> he said in verse 4, you know the way where I'm going. And doubtful Thomas at verse 5 says, oh, no, Jesus, you overestimate us. We don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way that you're going? What is this? Jesus, you, you told Peter that we can't go with you yet. 
and yet you now say that we get where you're going and that we know how that's happening? How can we know the route to get there? We don't even know the destination. Well, I can sympathize with the frustration of this doubtful Thomas. He's he's obviously caught in a very tense and emotional situation on that Thursday evening. And as the evening progressed, I mean, it it started with the servant didn't show up to wash the feet, and Jesus ends up at his feet washing his feet. That's enough to create turmoil. And then after a while, Judas takes off. What's that all about? There are a lot of things going on that aren't right. And now Jesus seems to be talking in riddles. What's going on tonight? Well, In his frustration, Thomas probably overstates the case when he says, we don't know. How can we know? Well, we don't know Jesus. Well, he knew a lot. I mean, he's been listening for three years. Jesus has talked a lot about these things. But for Thomas, the pieces just don't fit together. Jesus, tell me again. (laughs) So Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way, the route, the the means to get there. And then when he says, I'm the life, that's explaining this route. And when he says, I'm the truth, that's explaining this route. But because truth is, well, truth is God revealed. And Jesus is the revelation of God. Jesus is the truth. And we discover what God is like and what his relationship with people is when we study this person, Jesus. Life? Well, that's God communicated to someone. Non-life can't become life if there's no God. But here... Jesus says, I am the way. Look at me at the truth. Look at me. I am the source of life. Someone wrote, the way to God lies in the knowledge of the truth about him and in the experience of his life. So in Jesus, you and I see the very life of God himself. Jesus is the embodiment of truth for us. Jesus is the link between us and God. And our culture wishes he had stopped right there. But he added another sentence. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to hear that sentence. That needs to be stressed. It needs to be stressed for our own sakes, lest we be deceived and thinks, begin to think there's somehow another way besides Jesus. It needs to be stressed for the sake of our friends and family members, lest they get the wrong impression. If our friends don't know Jesus, he says they're going to be permanently separated from God. But I hasten to say to us as Christians, you don't need to worry about being left behind. Jesus is the way to God. Okay, a third answer. Third thing that should give us peace from this passage. Jesus says that we see God in Jesus. That we see God through Jesus. Verse 9. Philip, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you for so long? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? There's something good about Philip's response, isn't there? If we could just see God, then we'd be satisfied. We 
He's not the first one to talk about that. I think one of the fascinating stories in the Bible is the story of Moses and his interaction with God and that point where Moses finally said to God, show me your glory. I just want to see you. And there's something wonderful about that. There's something wonderful about Psalm 63. Oh, so have I looked to see your power and your glory. Those are wonderful things. But they don't fit here. <laughs> Philip has missed everything that Jesus is saying. When Philip says, show us the Father, he's showing, I don't get it, Jesus. I'm not sticking with you in this conversation. And he gets a, a gentle rebuke from Jesus. Don't you know me? Don't you know that anyone who's seen me has seen the Father? Don't you know, Philip, that I am united to the Father? That's what he says in the next couple of verses. I am the one who reveals God, and the only one... Only way that someone can see God is to know me. Jesus is saying to Philip, know both what I say and what I do. For both my words and my works show that I am united to God. Verse 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Those are the words. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Haven't you been paying attention, Philip, as to what I've been doing for the last three years? Haven't you been listening as I've been speaking to you for the last three years? Both those things say that we can see God in Jesus. And then he adds, almost as a postscript, verse 12, that once more causes us to say, what, 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 Jesus? Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. You're going to be a follower of Jesus? You're going to do greater things than Jesus has done? All those marvelous things Jesus has been doing for the last three years? <laughs> he says, the proof that you can see God in me is the things you're going to be able to do, my disciples. And you say, well, did it happen? It wasn't much after that that they began to perform miracles. It wasn't long after that that Peter was there at the temple and there was that lame man and Peter had him stand up and walk. Wonderful miracle. The purpose was the same as the miracles Jesus had been doing to certify that these men are God's men, that God is speaking through these people just as God spoke through Jesus. Greater things? Greater things than Jesus did? Well, in Acts 2, on that day of Pentecost, the scripture says that 3,000 people had their minds open. They saw Jesus. They were pricked to the heart. They responded. They were baptized. They became followers. 3,000? Jesus had not seen 3,000 respond in one day. You read on through Acts and you see that influence getting wider and wider going over to the island of Cyprus, up to the country of Greece, all through Italy, all through the known world of that day went the influence in just a generation or two greater than what Jesus had done. Jesus said, you'll do that. And all that will teach you that we see God in Jesus. Verse 13, 
and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So we pray on the basis of what Jesus has taught us. And we see God in Jesus. We come to God through Jesus. Our prayers are answered so that God can be glorified. God enables us to understand what he says. And then we know what he wants. And then we can pray according to his will. And we're praying in the same way Jesus would pray. And our prayers are answered, and God is honored. What's the conclusion of all this? We can and should be at peace. Even if we're standing beside an open grave, even if we're walking among the tombstones, remembering the people that were once with us and are no longer here. We should be at peace. Jesus spoke these words to his immediate disciples to quiet their hearts, hearts that were in turmoil, and to resolve that fear they had that somehow in all this turmoil they were going to be left So I say to myself this morning, and I say to you, we don't have to be afraid. Believing in Jesus, we will not be left behind. We will experience the love of God, the God who is the answer to all the issues that frighten us in this life and in anticipation of the next. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Oh God, to the extent that I have reflected the truth of your words, don't let those words be snatched away from us by some activity of Satan, by some activity of his followers, by just the busyness of our own lives, cause those words to deeply impact us, to be embedded in us in such a way that they are part of who we are in the good days and in the bad. Pray in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Armstrong, for bringing God's word to us. Let's uh, join together in prayer uh, to the Lord. Lord God, we praise you this day for the opportunity to come to church and to worship you. Together we join in song and readings and we listen to your word preached to us. We praise and thank you for this opportunity to take a break in our busy schedules to worship and praise you. We also thank you for the summer break and the rest it has provided. Thank you for family and vacations. We praise you for the wonderful things we have seen and done. Your creation is truly vast and wonderful. Whether we have had the, an opportunity to travel far or have remained close to home, we have seen the beauty of flowers, trees, sunny days, and rain, and we are in awe of the beauty and diversity of your creation. We praise you for Jesus and his saving work. We have just heard a renewed invitation to follow him in our lives. 
We need your spirit to be able to do this. It is your grace alone which prods us to follow, and without your continued support, we will fail. We pray that you help us to follow him with all our heart. Thank you that we are able to ask this in Jesus' name and receive the assurance that you will provide it. We confess, Lord, that we have fallen far short in our efforts to follow you. Even as we see your light shining in the world, we also see the darkness. We live among pain and violence, natural disasters and persecution. We feel helpless to make a difference. We confess that we live daily lives focused on our own concerns and often neglect to bring our concerns and requests to you. We fail to be a shining light in our community and to advocate for justice in our society. Forgive us for our lack of devotion and help us to remember that this is your world and that we are your people and we need to make a difference. And our world needs us to make a difference. We thank you for our leaders and the work that they do. We have many volunteers and staff who come together to make our congregation vibrant and effective. Thank you for Pastor John and the leadership he provides. Supply his needs and provide him with insight so that he may spur us on to a closer relationship with you. We pray for Joel as he balances family care and leading worship. Help us to assist him as the burden weighs heavily on him. Provide insight and energy to the elders and deacons so they can support and provide and care for the congregation. As many programs begin again at this time of year, we ask that you bless them. Bless our effort for education and fellowship. We pray that you will encourage the leaders of the various ministries so that they may lead with enthusiasm and skill. Bless parents as they strive to help their children learn about you and what it means to be a child of the King. We put so much pressure on our time with so many events. Give us the courage and insight to say no to activities which conflict with our devotion to you. We have many needs among us. We pray for Jeannie Wiener, Ginny Jupp, and Rick Hopp. Continue to uphold them as they live in pain and receive treatment. It has already been so long and the struggle continues. Bless the care that they receive and provide the healing that only you can give. Most of all, provide them with your constant presence and assurance. We pray for others who are experiencing health and emotional struggles in their lives. We pray for Mike Lakey as he recovers from knee surgery. We pray that you'll provide healing and therapy. We pray for Houston and Haley Waldman as they continue to uh, grow and to be nurtured in the hospital. We pray that they may come home soon. We pray for those who have been affected by the hurricane. Provide relief and we pray that your people may be instrumental in providing that relief and that care. You know all of our needs, and we pray for your healing power for those needs, stated and unstated. We pray for George and Henrietta Taminga and for Jenny Post, who are no longer able to worship with us in person. Bless them with your presence as they worship elsewhere. We live in a time when we have so many distractions which compete for our devotion. It is so difficult for us to stay centered on what really matters in our lives. Help us to slow down. Enable us to love and care for each other. Lord, help us to put you first in our lives and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In the name of Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior, amen. Before we go to our offering, uh, Mike Lakey is going to come up and talk to us a bit about uh, the life group and the strategies and plans for this year. don't know me. I'm Mike Lakey. My wife Sue and I are the leaders of the Life Group Ministry. I do have to share a little something I heard before the service today. I was talking to Dave and he said he's going to a training and they've changed their small group ministry to Life Group as well. So maybe we started a trend. I don't know. 
So uh, uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention to you is kind of what's going on in life groups, but also how things kind of connect together. So you've heard uh, John preach and speak to us several, many, many times actually, about the fact that we don't go to church, we are the church. And there's three things, and they're on our website, I just looked at them recently. One is to find a group to nurture our faith. Second is to find a ministry that we can participate in and use our gifts. And the third is to find a community uh, organization or group that we can be a part of. Life Groups does a great job of focusing on that first goal of growing spiritually. Um, a life group, just for those that aren't aware, there's four areas that we like to kind of focus on. We don't always hit all those areas every week, and a lot of times some of those things are done sporadically. But number one starts with being centered and our foundation of studying God's word. After that is to share with one another. And that's through encouragement, but also even accountability. Uh, the third is to pray for one another at the groups, but also probably more importantly in between times. And then also find ways to serve one another. And there have been many examples of service of small groups in different areas. And I'd like to thank the one small group that made bringing meals to Sue and I for the last uh, a few weeks when I was not even getting around as little as I am now. So thank you for that. There have been a lot of opportunities that people have gone out of their way to help those in our church community and even outside. So we encourage you to do that as well. Uh, my concern always for myself, for my family, and for our church is where are we growing spiritually? And so I'd like you to think about that. Where, which group am I a part of that's challenging me and helping me to grow? Maybe it's not a life group. Maybe there's another place that you can get that. But I know for Sue and I, it's a burden on our hearts for each one of you to find that place. As we have as mentioned before, and uh, Rob prayed about, that there's a lot of distractions in our lives. So... Where do we turn for that? Do we go to Philemon or do we go to Facebook? Do we go to Titus or do we go to Twitter? Do we go to Nehemiah or do we go to Netflix? Where is our focus? Because we always find times for the things that are important to us, but where is God in the center of that? So that's my challenge to you and to myself as well to find that as a key. Life groups is a great opportunity for that. It's not the only one, but it's a great opportunity for that. So if you're starting your new season, I encourage you to get together with your leaders, talk about what it is that you would like to study. We've given, we've sent a list of some possibilities to work on that. If you're not in a small group and have never been in one and you'd like to know more about it, uh, or you've been in a group before and like to consider joining a group again. Um, the bosses and the Haley's will be out in the narthex with, I think they're teal colored um, little clipboards for you to give your information and to sign up. Uh, we do encourage that. One thing I would love to share with you is that last year, um, through the leadership of the church and through some of the input of some of the people, we started two new multi-generational groups that meet after church, um, and we had great success with that. So we, we would treasure your input on things to make the ministry better. Um, if you want to contact us, um, you can con look at the information on, on the website uh, for contact, or if you see Sue or I, uh, for those of you that don't uh, know Sue, she's the one who's zipping around in her motorized wheelchair, um, uh, and you'll see her in grab one of us, or the Haley's or the bosses will be out there today. I'm sure they'll be willing to answer any questions that you have as well, or contact the church, and John or Sarah will make sure that we get that information. Thank you again, those of you that are leaders, especially for your commitment to your groups. We encourage you again, if you're in a group, 
to really focus on growing spiritually this year. If you're not, take the leap of faith. Take the step. Let us know what you would be interested in, a time, a place, and we'd be more than willing to try and work that out for you. Thank you. Good morning. I am Chad Woldman, one of the deacons here at Lombard. Um, today's offering is for the Benevolence Fund. Uh, please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that we can come and worship you, and now that we can continue to do that with our tithes and our offerings. Um, thank you for the Benevolence Fund and the blessing it is to be able to give to others in our congregation. And just um, give us wisdom in applying these funds. In your name we pray. Amen.
understand. Parting blessing, our word of benediction from our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. To the fountain, all who have said the river of heartache, come to the sea, come on, be set free. Lord, I 
Where you live. 